The next portion of the rules that we're going to cover together are about communications about legal services. Here, this is going to make up four to 10% of your total MPRE exam. First things first, I always like to start by pointing out that commercial speech is constitutionally protected speech. I make this point because we're about to talk about the rules regarding attorneys' rights and ability to advertise their services. So, attorneys' advertisements about their services falls into the category of commercial speech. And commercial speech is protected speech. It is speech that can be regulated nonetheless, but it is protected speech. So taking it from the top, the first rule I want to discuss says that a lawyer may advertise services through written, recorded, or electronic communication, including public media. The following things are permitted in an attorney's advertisement. They can talk about their name or their law firm's name, their address, email address, website, and telephone number basically their contact information. They can talk about the types of services that they will undertake. So if you're a divorce attorney or immigration attorney, you can talk about those things in your advertisement. You can discuss the basis in which your fee is going to be calculated, including prices for specific services, as well as payment and credit arrangements. So if you um, will file and complete a divorce for someone for $500 as a flat fee, you can include that in your advertisement. If you work on a contingency fee basis, you can include that in your advertisement. You can talk about whether or not you have any foreign language ability. So for instance, if you speak and read and are fluent in Spanish, you can include that information in your advertisement. And then lastly, so long as you have your client's consent, you can talk about the names of your references and clients that you regularly represent. If you think that this type of information would invite the attention of those people, um, other people seeking legal assistance. The next part of the rule I want to talk about is all about reciprocal referral agreements. So this rule says that a lawyer shall not give anything of value to a person for recommending the lawyer's services, except that a lawyer may refer clients to another lawyer or non-lawyer professional pursuant to an agreement not otherwise prohibited under these rules that provides for that other person to refer clients or customers to the lawyer. They can enter into this agreement so long as the following requirements are met. First, this reciprocal referral agreement is not exclusive. This means that the parties, one of which is the lawyer, cannot promise to send every single client to this other professional. Um, the lawyer has to maintain his or her own professional uh, judgment. So if the lawyer believes that their client will not best be served by this person that they have this reciprocal agreement with, they shall not be referring people to that professional. The second requirement is that the client is informed of the existence and nature of this agreement. So if you are going to refer your client to this person that you have this agreement with, you should let your client know about this agreement that's in place. And then additionally, this reciprocal arrangement must not interfere with the lawyer's professional judgment as to making referrals and providing legal services. So again, the lawyer has to maintain their own independent professional judgment. So if the lawyer does not believe that their client would be best served by a doctor that they have entered into this referral arrangement with, then the lawyer should not refer that client to that doctor. Instead, the lawyer should refer their client to a different doctor that they think is better equipped to help their client. And if a lawyer has entered into one of these reciprocal referral agreements or arrangements, uh, these arrangements or agreements need to be reevaluated from time to time. Um, they should not be for an indefinite duration. The next rule that I would like to discuss is all about solicitation. So the rule says that a lawyer shall not by in-person, live telephone, or real-time electronic contact solicit professional employment when a significant motive for the lawyer's doing so is pecuniary gain, meaning to make money. Let's stop there. So this means we shall not, by in-person or real-time contact, try to solicit employment from someone if we are motivated to make money. But this also means you can solicit uh, your services to someone if you are offering to work for free. So let's say that you are a civil rights attorney and you come to find out about some sort of civil rights violation in your community and you want to represent the victim 
of this violation and you want to represent them for free. Well, then you can contact them if you want and you can offer your services. Why? Because you are not asking them to hire you and to pay you. You are offering to work for free. Therefore, it removes itself from this rule because you're motiv you are not being motivated by pecuniary gain. To pick back up where we left off with this rule, it goes on to tell us that you can solicit other lawyers other family members or people in which you have close personal relationships with, or previous clients, people that you have prior professional relationships with. And you can solicit those people even if you are motivated to make money. Think about why this rule exists. This rule is here to protect the public so that lawyers are not preying upon people who are vulnerable and putting a lot of pressure on these vulnerable people to feel forced to hire someone who is soliciting employment from them in person or in real time. That's why this rule exists. So if you are soliciting employment from say a family member or a previous client, we would like to think that you have a different type of relationship with those people. And those people would be inclined to hire you anyways, or they would feel comfortable to say, no, thank you. I'm not interested in hiring you. The whole dynamic of the relationship is different. The next portion of the rule says, a lawyer shall not solicit professional employment by written, recorded, or electronic communication, or by in-person telephone or real-time electronic contact, even when not otherwise prohibited, if the target of the solicitation has made it known to the lawyer that they have a desire not to be solicited. Meaning, if you are calling your prior clients and they tell you to stop soliciting them, then you should stop soliciting them. Or the lawyer, uh, the rule says, um, even though you would otherwise be permitted to solicit another attorney or someone that you have a previous professional relationship with, you shall not do that if it involves coercion, duress, or harassment. And that's for the obvious reasons. The next rule that I want to talk about is all about mail. So it says every written, recorded, or electronic communication from a lawyer soliciting professional employment from anyone uh, to be known to be in need of legal services in a particular matter shall include the words advertising material on the outside of the envelope, if any, and at the beginning and ending of any recorded or electronic communication, unless the recipient of this communication is another lawyer, a family member, a close friend, or a previous client of the lawyers. So let's stop there. This means that you can send for instance, mail or a flyer or a letter to someone that you know to be in need of legal services. And you can offer your services. But this mailer or letter or flyer must contain the words advertising material on it. You do not have to include those words if you are soliciting employment from someone you are allowed to solicit, such as another lawyer, for example. Additionally, this requirement to include those words advertising material on um, these types of things is not required if you are responding to some sort of communication from a potential client or from their spokesperson. So for instance, if someone reached out to you and inquired about your services and you are responding, your response does not have to include the words advertising material on it. Additionally, this rule to include the words advertising material does not apply to general announcements by lawyers, including changes in their personnel or in their office locations, because these do not constitute communications so, um, soliciting professional employment from a client known to be need in need of legal services within the meaning of this rule. So let's say, for instance, you have um, hired a new associate. Um, and you want to make sure that everyone in your local community knows that maybe you are now offering more services or you have the ability to take on more clients and you just want everyone to know about the changes in your personnel. You can send out a flyer that makes this type of general announcement and you do not have to include the words advertising material on it. The next rule that I want to talk about uh, goes back to advertising basically and communications about our services. So here the rule says, a lawyer shall not make a false or misleading communication about the lawyer or their services. A communication is false or misleading if it contains a material misrepresentation of fact or law, or if it omits a fact necessary to make the statement considered as a whole, not materially misleading. So 
kind of starting at the most obvious. This means in your um, advertisements, for instance, or in any communications about yourself or your services, don't lie. This also means do not lie by omission. Do not fail to include a fact that would put the reader on notice of everything they need to know. Let's go through some examples. Our first says an advertisement that truthfully reports a lawyer's achievements on behalf of clients or former clients may be misleading. If it's presented so as to lead a reasonable person to form an unjustified expectation that the same results could be obtained for other clients in similar matters without reference to specific factual and legal circumstances of each client's case. Our second example talks about how an unsubstantiated comparison of the lawyer's services or fees with services or fees of other lawyers. So for instance, if their advertisement says, our firm wins 20% more cases than any other firm in the state. This may be misleading if it's presented with such specificity as would lead a reasonable person to conclude that the comparison can be substantiated. The inclusion of an appropriate disclaimer or qualifying language may preclude a finding that a statement is likely to, to create an unjustified expectation or otherwise mislead the public. Additionally, some information for you about what is considered misleading in some jurisdictions is that oftentimes um, jurisdictions have rules that state if you promise a client a certain outcome, that is misleading. So for instance, um, if I promise you that I'm going to save your house from foreclosure, that's often considered misleading in most jurisdictions. But if I change my language so that it appears to be more aspirational in nature, so as to say something like, I am dedicated to preserving your interests in your home, that would be permissible because it's illustrating to the client that I'm dedicated to their legal cause of action and I'm going to do my best, but it is not guaranteeing an outcome such as I'm going to save your home. So keep that in mind when it comes to what is considered misleading. Let's talk about communications about law firm names. So first and foremost, the rules state that a lawyer shall not use a firm name, a letterhead or other professional designation that's false or misleading. We just got done talking about how our communications about ourselves or about our firms cannot be false or misleading. So this rule is following suit. The next rule says a trade name may be used by a lawyer in private practice if it does not imply a connection with the government agency or with the public or charitable legal services organization and is not false or misleading. So for instance, um, I could name my law firm ABC Legal Clinic. That would be considered a trade name and likely a permissible one. However, if a private firm uses a trade name that includes a geographical name, such as the Springfield Legal Clinic, an express disclaimer is necessary to illustrate that it is not a public legal aid agency so that people are not misled. So for instance, if I wanted to create a law firm that, and I call myself the Detroit Legal Clinic, I would need to include a disclaimer to let the general public know that this is a private firm and it is not at all connected to the city of Detroit or its agencies in any way. Additionally, any firm name, including the name of deceased partners, is strictly speaking a trade name. The use of such a name to designate law firms has proven as a very useful means of identification. After all, law firms are businesses. So if a law firm has been known by a certain name for a very long time and then one of the partners dies, it seems like it would be confusing or kind of harsh to require the law firm to take down that deceased member's name. And they do not have to. That law firm name has become a trade name under these rules. However, the rules make it clear that it is misleading to use the name of a lawyer that is not associated with the firm or some sort of predecessor of the firm or the name of a non-lawyer. Additionally, a law firm with offices in more than one jurisdiction may use the name of other professional, I'm sorry, a law firm with offices in more than one jurisdiction may use the same name or other professional designation in each jurisdiction, but they must identify the lawyers in each office of that firm in which those lawyers can practice. In other words, 
we need to be able to tell, um, as the public, the jurisdictional limitations upon the attorneys that are associated with this firm. So for instance, um, a lot of big firms have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of attorneys, but that doesn't mean that every single attorney is licensed to practice law in every single state in which there is an office. And these types of uh, designations and limitations need to be made known in these law firm names. Additionally, the name of a lawyer holding a public office shall not be used in the name of a law firm or in communications on its behalf during any substantial period of time in which that lawyer is not actively and regularly participating in the firm. So let's say, um, you know, a lawyer uh, was a named partner and their name was used in the law firm name and they leave the firm to go take public office. Well, their name needs to come off of that law firm's name while they are no longer working at that firm, because otherwise that's misleading and confusing. And then the last rule I want to talk about in this section is all about communicating uh, regarding fields of specialization. So first and foremost, the rule says a lawyer may communicate the fact that the lawyer does or does not practice in particular fields of law. So for instance, if I wanted to advertise that I'm an immigration attorney, I can do that. That's illustrating to the public that this is the type of law I practice, so if you have an immigration problem, you can come to me, and that is permissible. The rule also says that a lawyer shall not state or imply that the lawyer is certified as a specialist in a particular field of law unless the lawyer has been certified as a specialist by an organization that has been approved by the appropriate state authority or is one that has been accredited by the American Bar Association. And secondly, the name of that certifying organization must be clearly identified in that communication. In other words, we do not want attorneys, you know, creating some sort of fake um, certification that they are specialized and then advertising that they're some sort of certified specialist. Instead, we want to be sure that if attorneys are advertising that they are certified specialists, that we know who certified them and that that certifying agency is one in which we recognize, meaning, say, the ABA recognizes them as a certifying agency. And that wraps up our rules on this subsection that we are covering today, and we're going to move on to the next.